Hello and welcome to Road to Tokyo. I'm Tracy Holmes. Today we hear from an Olympic debutante and a Games veteran, plus how the creators of Hello Kitty are tackling sexism with satire in Japan. Incompetent women are such a pain in the ass, but they're better than the competent ones, am I right? <laughs> But first, crowds in Tokyo have been banned from the opening and closing ceremonies. Athletes are now pondering a games in entirely empty venues as Japan goes back into a state of emergency due to another spike in COVID-19 infections. Organisers had been working on the basis of 50% capacity at venues capped at 10,000 people. But medical experts have continued to push for no fans amid widespread public concern the games will lead to a surge of cases. History will be made at the opening ceremony as it becomes the first to take place in an empty stadium. It will also be historic for Australia's flag bearers. Olympic gold medal swimmer Kate Campbell and champion basketballer Paddy Mills will carry the flag at the opening ceremony. Campbell becomes the first female swimmer to be selected for the role, while Mills is the first ever Indigenous athlete chosen. 16 of the 472 athletes named in the Australian team are Indigenous. That's the highest number of First Nations people to be selected for a Games. Maurice Longbottom, a member of the Darawal Nation, is making his Olympic de uh, debut in the Rugby Sevens competition. And he joins us now. Maurice, thanks so much for your time. The pressure's really on the men's Sevens team, isn't it? Because the women went to Rio and won gold. Have you been thinking about that as inspiration? Um, that's not really something we've been thinking about. Um, we're just more focused on going over there um, and doing our job that we've been tasked with, and that's going over there to come back with a gold medal. And is there much of a bond between the men's and women's team? Because you're in camp together in Queensland now, aren't you? Yeah, we're in camp together. Um, like there's, there's always that bond there. We always say hello and get out to each other and stuff like that. But. No, we don't really train much against them, so, but, you know, we're always having a chat and saying hello. So, Maurice, what are your expectations of an Olympic Games? Um, well, I don't really know what to expect, really. Um, there's, I don't know if there's going to be crowds or if there's only local crowds or anything, so I'm just trying to take it as it comes and just treat it like any other game, really. I've read on uh, the rugby website that if there's one man who can bring crowds back to rugby, it's you. Now, that's an incredible pressure, but it also says a lot about the fact that you really enjoy the way you play the game, but you were a late convert, weren't you? How did you get into sevens? Yeah, I've played league my whole life, um, but, you know, just one little um, sevens tournament that I played with my cousin sort of changed it all for me. Um, and I just fell in love with the game ever since, and I haven't really looked back. And so how do you get that measure right? Because we know that at elite level, sport is very serious, but to be able to go out there and always enjoy yourself, what sort of a mindset do you take into every game you play? Well, I think it's just going out there and having fun. If you're, not, if you're not out there enjoying yourself or you're not having fun with your teammates, then you're not really, you're not really gonna be there. Um, so I just go out there and you know, do my, my job as best as I can and make sure I'm enjoying it. And, having you know having fun out there with my teammates and what did you think of the news that paddy mills one of your fellow indigenous team members has been chosen to carry the flag at the opening ceremony yeah it's amazing um you know great opportunity for paddy there to, to hold the flag and then to hold our flag also our, our aboriginal flag and to fly that high for us as well so um, i'm super stoked for him and it'll be such an honor maurice good luck to you and the rugby sevens team thanks for your time today Thank you so much. Cheers. Well, from a debutante to a Games veteran now, discus thrower Danny Stevens will be competing in her fourth Olympic Games, and she's with us now. Danny, do Olympic campaigns get any easier as the experience grows? No, I don't think so. Uh, this is actually the hardest team for me to make, and uh, it's probably the one where we're going to have to be uh, the most adaptable and face the most challenges when we're over there. And why was it the hardest to make for you? I suffered a pretty significant injury uh, at the start of last year, 2020. Um, I had ended up having to have spinal surgery and I lost uh, all strength in my right arm and I'm a right-handed discus thrower. So the recovery for that was really long and really frustrating and really hard. So 
um, I'm one of the ones who definitely benefited from having a lot more time to prepare uh, an extra 12 months under my belt for this Olympics. It's interesting, isn't it? The, the different stories you hear of how people have dealt with that COVID delay. Um, but that also sounds like personally for you, it wasn't just a physical challenge, but a real mental challenge also. Oh, 100%. It was, it was really difficult. And it happened uh, just as, you know, I was training really well and yeah, just an accident in the gym and ended up needing urgent surgery within three weeks. And just, uh, you know, COVID was starting to hit Australian shores and gyms were starting to be locked down and everything. So I think I was about four weeks post operation when they uh, postponed the Olympics. So, and surprisingly, I was still really disappointed, <laughs> even though I was at home and I couldn't really lift my arms still, um, I was still really devastated because, you know, 2020 in Tokyo was something that we looked forward to for such a long time. So it took a little bit like all athletes to wrap my head around that. Uh, but I took a few weeks to really sit down with myself and say, do I really want to do this? And do I really want to do another 12 months, especially now that I'm sitting here with barely any function uh, being a right-handed discus thrower? So, yeah, it did take a lot. And uh, yeah, that's where my support team were so fantastic. And they just they came around me and helped support me mentally more than anything. And it's been a good 12 months of rehab and you know, we're finally looking to head overseas in a couple of weeks. So it's really exciting. So knowing what you've gone through and you had to sit down and really ask yourself, do I want this? Because the amount of effort that was required, which is uh, just outstanding anyway, but on top of a career threatening injury like that, why is it that you wanted to do this? Why did you want to come back for another one? I'd always had it in my head that I wanted to go to Tokyo and I was really, really excited. I'm 33 and, you know, discus throwers tend to peak beyond 30. So I always had it in my mind that I was going to Tokyo and despite the challenges that it threw up uh, in, a, in all athletes' um, way, that it was, I, I just felt like I still had a lot of potential left and I still had a lot of things that I wanted to tick off my uh, my list of, of, you know, goals that I had set back when I was 16. and the one that had dri driven me the most was to win an Olympic gold medal. And I came fourth in Rio, so I was so close, but yet so far away. So that goal that I set so long ago is still driving me and was the main motivation in, in getting back and qualifying and being selected for the uh, the Olympics in 2021. So, you know, I just wanted, I knew I could throw, get back to where I was and I knew I could hopefully be in personal best shape. So yeah, that was the thing that was driving me the most. And I knew that I just had to owe it to myself to, to, to do the hard work and to prove that I could get back. You know, I had to regain, regain function uh, just for day-to-day -day activities. You know, I, I couldn't lift a drink bottle or drive or, you know, cut veggies up or anything like that. So I had to do the rehab just to regain normal function. And then I said to myself, if I can ever throw a discus again, that would just be the icing on the cake. Uh, because I was told that there's no guarantee, you know, the nerve um, root compression that I had up in my neck through the disc bulge uh, was really bad and that I may never regain 100% function again. Um, I think I'm one of the really lucky ones who has regained function and it probably was about February, March this year when we started competing in the domestic season that I felt back to my old self. Uh, but a lot of that time away from throwing last year is kind of, uh, you know, has been the real challenge the last few months to get my rhythm and timing back for discus throwing. So I'm super grateful to be able to you know, have regained function and be able to go to these Olympics and give it another crack. Danny, it's an incredible story. We wish you all the very best for Tokyo. Thanks for your time today. All right, thank you. Well, we know athletes make a lot of sacrifices. We've just heard about one there. But as Taekwondo competitor Safwan Khalil shares in his Road to Tokyo diary, some things are harder to give up than others. Hello, beautiful people. I've had my very intense training session today, just had my very clean dinner, and all I want to do is sit back and have a sweet, sweet snack. I really want this. Can't have that, I must have this. Want this. Must have this. So just a little background about what we do in Taekwondo. At the Olympic Games, the men's division only comes down to four weight divisions. Which, we, which is what makes it really unique. And I fight in the men's under 58 kilogram division. Yes, under 58 kilos. And I'm about 184 centimeters tall. So I'm quite tall and I need to stay really, really lean. And now that we're getting so much closer to comp, I have to be a little bit more stricter and really cut out even those little things that may hinder my weight. So 
it's an art form. It's something I've been doing for so many years now. And it's really tough because I need to consume enough to give me the energy to get through training, but also make sure I'm dropping weight as well. So it's really, really hard. I find myself hungry all the time now. I find that I get a lot colder all the time, but that's normal. It's all a part of the process. One more time. I really want this, but I must have this. Uh, it's getting so close now. Thank you all so much for your support. He certainly got that. While Japan is often seen as a world leader in many areas, its traditional ways see it lag behind when it comes to gender balance. And as reporter Eleni Soltis explains, a popular cartoon has drawn attention to the issue. Oh, hello, kitty. <laughs> a few years ago, there was a shock revelation in Japan. The creators of Hello Kitty announced this much-loved character was not a kitten at all, uh. but a little schoolgirl. Surprise! But the very same people behind Hello Kitty soon created an antidote. Meet Retsuko. Retsuko. A 25-year-old red panda with a mundane office job, working long hours while enduring sexist colleagues. Incompetent women are such a pain in the ass, but they're better than the competent ones, am I right? <laughs> but after work, Retsuko goes to karaoke and vents. Okay, and back to work. Currently, 7 in 10 Japanese women work in Japan. It's a significant jump from 30 years ago. But on the issue of gender equality, Japan's gender gap is by far the largest among all advanced economies. In the latest World Economic Forum ranking, Japan trails behind 120 nations. Australia is currently placed 44th. And the representation of women in leadership roles in Japan isn't great either. It's ranked 166th globally for the number of women in parliament. And out of the 20 ministers in cabinet, there are only two women. The Olympic minister, Tamayo Marukawa, actually replaced another woman, Seiko Hashimoto, who's now the chief of the Tokyo Olympics. And she replaced former Prime Minister Yoshiro Mori after he made sexist remarks. If we increase the number of female board members, we have to make sure their speaking time is restricted. They have difficulty finishing, which is annoying. Mori made those comments because the Japanese Olympic Committee board had been wanting to increase the number of female board directors to 40%. In 2003, the Japanese government committed to having 30% of leadership positions across the private and public sectors occupied by women by 2020. Japan was nowhere near that target. That's perhaps because the target was never binding. Women last year held just 6% of director positions on the boards of Japanese listed companies. A few years ago, a Japanese government survey found almost a third of women have been sexually harassed at work. Even commuting to work is problematic. There are women-only carriages on trains to protect women from gropers. And recently, a company started selling stamps so women could imprint their attackers. They've had the We Too movement, which put the onus on employers to commit to a safe workplace. And there's also been the Kutu movement, a play on words for kutsu, the Japanese word for shoe, and kutsu, which means pain. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. A national petition called for the government to ban companies from making high heels compulsory in the workplace. The government ignored the petition. Perhaps that's something else women are screaming about when they're alone in the karaoke bar. And that's all for this week's Road to Tokyo. Bye for now.